Scorch Trials, Chapter 13, on this PDF, page 47. Thomas felt it getting late and knew they had to get to sleep that night and be ready for the morning. So he and the Gladers spent the rest of the evening making crude packs out of bed sheets for carrying the food and the extra clothes that had appeared in the dressers. Some of the food had come in plastic bags, and the now empty bags were filled with water and tied off with material ripped from the curtains. No one expected these poor excuses for canteens to last very long without leaking, but it was the best idea anyone could come up with. Newt had finally convinced Minot to be the leader. Thomas knew as well as anybody that they needed someone to be in charge, so he was relieved when Minot grudgingly agreed. Around nine o'clock, Thomas found himself lying in bed, starting, staring at the bunk above him once again. The room was strangely silent, even though he knew no one had fallen asleep yet. Fear surely gripped them as much as it did him. They'd been through the maze and its horrors. They'd seen close up what Wicked, Wicked was capable of doing. If Ratman was correct and all that had happened was part of some master plan, then these people forced Galley to kill Chuck, had shot a woman at close range, had hired people to rescue them only to kill them when the mission was complete. The list went on and on. To top it off, they gave them a hideous disease, with the cure as bait to lure them to continue. Who even knew what was true and what was a lie? And the evidence continued to suggest that they'd singled Thomas out somehow. It was a sad thought. Chuck was the one who had lost his life. Teresa was the one missing. But taking those two away from him... His life felt like a black hole. He had no idea how he would muster the will to go on in the morning, to face whatever wicked had in store for them. But he'd do it, and not just to get a cure. He would never stop, eventually, especially now. Not after what they'd done to him and his friends. If the only way to get back at them was to pass all their tests and trials to survive, then so be it. So be it with thoughts of revenge actually comforting him in a sick and twisted way, he finally fell asleep. Every glader had set the alarm on his digital watch for five o'clock in the morning. Thomas woke up well before that and couldn't go back to sleep. When beeps finally started filling the room, he swung his legs off the bed and rubbed his eyes. Someone turned on the light and a yellow blast lit up his vision. Squinting, he got up and headed for the showers. Who knew how long it'd be before he could clean himself again? At ten minutes till the time appointed by Ratman, every glader sat in anticipation, most holding a plastic bag full of water, the bedsheet packs at their sides. Thomas, like the others, had decided he'd carry the water in his hand to make sure it didn't spill or leak. The invisible shield had reappeared overnight in the middle of the common area, impossible to pass through and the gladers settled just on the boy's dorm side of it, facing where the stranger in the white suit had said a flat trans would appear. Eris was sitting right next to Thomas and spoke for the first time since, well, Thomas couldn't remember the last time he heard the boy's voice. Did you think you were crazy? The new kid asked. When you first heard her in your head, Thomas glanced at him, paused. For some reason, up until that moment, he hadn't wanted to talk about this guy, to this guy, but suddenly the feeling vanished completely. It wasn't Eris's fault that Teresa had disappeared. Yeah, then it, when it kept happening, I got over it. Only I started worrying about other people thinking I was crazy, so we didn't tell anyone about it for a long time. It was weird for me, Eris responded. He looked deep in thought as he stared at the floor. I was in a coma for a few days, and when I woke up, speaking out to Rachel seemed the most natural thing in the world. If she hadn't accepted it and spoken back, I'm pretty sure I would have lost it. The other girls in the group hated me. Some of them wanted to kill me. Rachel was the only one who... He trailed off, and Minot stood up to address everyone before Eris could finish what he was saying. Thomas was glad for it, because hearing about the trippy alternative version of what he himself had been through only made him think of Teresa, and that hurt too much. He didn't want to think about her anymore. 
He had to concentrate on surviving for now. We've got three minutes, Minot said, for once looking completely serious. Everybody sure they still want to go? Thomas nodded, noticed others doing the same. Anybody change their mind overnight, Minot asked. Speak now or never. Once we go wherever we're going, if some shank decides he's a sissy pants and tries to turn back, I'll make sure he does it with a broken nose and smashed privates. Thomas looked over at Newt, who had his head in his hands and was groaning loudly. Newt, you got a problem? Minot asked, his voice surprisingly stern. Thomas, shocked, waited for Newt's reaction. The older boy seemed just as surprised. Uh-oh. Uh, no. Just admiring your bloody leadership skills. Minot pulled his shirt away from his neck, leaned over to show everyone the tattoo there. What does it say, slint head? Newt glanced left and right, his face blushing. We know you're the boss, Minot. Slim it. No, you slim it, Minot retorted, pointing at Newt. We don't have time for that kind of clunk, so shut your hole. Thomas could only hope that Minot was putting on an act to solidify the decision they'd made for him to be the leader, and that Newt understood. Though if Minot was acting, he was sure doing a good job of it. It's six o'clock, one of the gladers shouted. As if this proclamation had triggered it, the invisible shield turned opaque again, fogging to a splotchy white. A split second later, it vanished altogether. Thomas noticed the change in the wall opposite them instantly. A large section of it had transformed into a flat, shimmering surface of murky, shadowy gray. Come on, Minot yelled as he pulled the strap of his pack onto his shoulder. He was gripping a water bag in his other hand. Don't mess around. We only have five minutes to get through. I'll go first, he pointed at Thomas. You go last. Make sure everyone follows me before you come. Thomas nodded, trying to fight the fire burning through his nerves. He reached up and wiped the sweat off his forehead. Minot walked up to the wall of gray, then paused right in front of it. The flat trans seemed completely unstable, impossible for Thomas to focus on. Shadows and swirls of varying shades of darkness danced across its surface. The whole thing pulsed and blurred, as if it might disappear at any second. Minot turned to look back at them. See you shanks on the other side. He, then he stepped through and the wall of gray murk swallowed him whole.